morning, Grace Mormon. Welcome here this morning. It's a little different seeing all your faces so clearly today in the theater. Normally it's so dark and I'm just like I'm preaching to a dark room, but here I can see everyone so clearly. So I'll be keeping an eye on you as I'm preaching, see if you're listening and sleeping. No, I, I won't. <laughs> but anyway, um, for, as you probably all know, for over a, a year now, we've been going through the book of Luke. And today we're going to once again be going uh, through Luke. We're just continuing on in that series and we're going to be in Luke chapter 10. And we're going to finish off the last five verses of that chapter today. And so if you could turn to Luke chapter 10 with me, that would be awesome. I think you'd find it super helpful. Uh, Whether you turn there in book or app form, either is fine with me. Um, Now, the passage that we're going to go through today in Luke chapter 10 in the last five verses of Luke, um, it might seem like a familiar story if you've been part of um, a church for some time or if you grew up in the church. It might seem quite familiar to you. If you're fairly new to Jesus or the church or the Bible, you might never have heard this story before, but that is totally okay because we're going to go through it together today. So we're going to play the passage on the screen behind me, and then we're going to pray together before we dig into God's Word today. Reading from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious, and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. All right, let's just pray before we dig into those verses. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you this morning for once again having the opportunity that we have to read and understand your word to us. It's really a privilege for us to be able to to look at the words that you've given us through your Holy Spirit by the pen of the writers, and we just want to say thank you for revealing yourself to us and just an unworthy people and making it possible for us to know you through your word. And So I just pray for wisdom this morning, that you would help me as I preach, that I would Preach in such a way uh, that the truth that we find in your word would be exposed and clear, and that I would also preach in such a way that your truth would once again just amaze us and cause us to run to you today and to love you more and to worship you more, that it would just soften our hearts this morning. I pray that the truth that's contained in your word would just reignite our passion for you and for the people around us. I pray this in your name. Amen. So, over the past while, as we have been going through Luke, we've seen that Jesus, he's been, he's been going throughout this region of Galilee and a few other places, teaching people about his kingdom. He has been healing people. He's been having conversations with people. He has cast out demons. He has even raised some people from the dead. And, and last week, Clay took us through the story of this lawyer who was trying to trap Jesus in what he said, and and Jesus tells this lawyer the story of this good Samaritan as a way of just revealing uh, God's love for humanity. And so Jesus has been very busy. And over the last while, Jesus, you could say he's been run off his feet, so to speak. And, And if we look back in Luke, as we've been going through it, we see that Jesus has, at times, uh, taken the time to get alone and to pray to his Father. He's taken some time to be alone with his disciples. And we, we see, though, that often these times where he's alone with his father or alone with his disciples, they don't last very long as very large crowds of people tend to find Jesus very quickly. And so today we see that Jesus enters this small village in verse 38. And we see this. It says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. So in this village that Jesus enters into, there is a woman named Martha who invites Jesus into her home. Now, we don't know for sure because it's not mentioned here, but it's likely that Jesus was with his disciples as well. And in this story, we see that Martha had a sister 
named Mary. Now, we also can't say with absolute certainty, but we assume that this is the same Mary and Martha that we find in the Gospel account of John chapter 11. In that chapter, we see that Mary and Martha had a brother named Lazarus. Uh, and this Lazarus, he had died, and he had been dead for a number of days, and Jesus had, had really grieved over his death. He was someone that Jesus loved. And, and then Jesus raised this man to life. And this, so, so we see that this family, or this uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, these brothers and sisters, um, are a family that Jesus loves. And it seems as though Jesus had this special bond with these three people in particular. So you get this picture here that Jesus has somehow been able to leave the large crowds behind, and now he gets to spend some time with his friends. In the Gospel of John, we also see that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived in the village of Bethany, which was only a couple miles from Jerusalem. And so this is the setting that we find ourselves in today. Jesus enters the house of some friends, and he is sharing with his friends and teaching them about who he is. And so we go on to verse 39, first, and, and the first part of verse 40. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. So we see that both of the sisters here, in this setting, one of them, Mary, is sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning, and Martha is serving. Now, we don't know what she's serving with, but it's likely she would have been making the food for everyone, maybe cleaning the dishes and bringing people coffee or something like that. You get the picture. She's serving her guests, and Martha is making herself busy, doing everything she can to make sure that her guests, and probably especially Jesus, um, is having the best experience while she's being a host. And meanwhile, you have Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning, listening to his teaching. And it is interesting that this language of sitting at the feet uh, in this Jewish culture was used to describe a student or a disciple. Paul actually used this language to describe his own education experience. He mentioned that he was educated at, at the feet of Gamaliel in Acts chapter 22. And so we see this same language being used here to describe Mary. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus. She was learning about who he was. She was a disciple, meaning a student of Jesus. Now, in this culture, that would have been almost unheard of. The women were not typically allowed to be disciples or students of the rabbis or the teachers. But as we see later on in the story, Jesus loves Mary, and he loves it that Mary would sit at his feet and learn as he teaches. Mary, as a student or as a disciple, was not the norm for the culture, but Jesus is not beholden to cultural norms. He loves people, and by his actions, he turns these cultural traditions on their head. And now, just so we don't get confused what a disciple is, the 12 disciples of Jesus were in a special category of disciples, you could say. Um, they were actually called apostles. But all of us, if we are Jesus followers, if we learn about Jesus, and if we know him, we are his disciples, men or women. It doesn't matter. If we love Jesus, we have to be learning and growing in our knowledge of who Jesus is and what he's done. And we have to be growing in our obedience to his teaching. This is a disciple of Jesus. If we're learning and growing in our knowledge of Jesus and in our knowledge of his kingdom and who he is and growing in our love for, for God's people, then we are disciples of Jesus. And Mary here was in the posture of a disciple learning at the feet of Jesus. It might seem strange that education or discipleship was described as being at the feet of someone, but that's how it was. And I can remember back to, to my elementary school days, and sometimes the teacher would take a book and read the class a story. And the teacher would set up a chair in the front of the class for, for her to sit in, and we would all hop out of our desks, and we would sit on the floor in the front of the class, and we would all be gathered around the teacher, and she would read one page, and then once she was done reading that page, she would turn the book to us and like kind of wave it around from left to right so we could see the picture. And, and we would love that because we're not doing schoolwork and we're getting a story read to us. This is great. We love that as kids. And I can imagine that, that sitting at the feet of Jesus or any other teacher would have been sort of like that. You would have the teacher sitting on the chair or stool and everyone gathered in so they could all hear, all sitting on the floor next to the feet of Jesus. And Mary's just soaking everything in. What a privilege to be able to have a private teaching session from Jesus in your own home. Mary knew that this was a, a special opportunity for her to just learn directly from the mouth of Jesus. Jesus was busy, and he was out and about a lot. And so opportunities like this would have been very few and far in between. 
Martha, on the other hand, she is not pleased with Mary. Martha has been serving up a storm, making sure everything is just perfect, so she has not even been able to hear any of Jesus' teaching. Verse 40 said she was distracted with much serving. She had no ability to take in the privilege of Jesus' teaching in her own home. She was not very happy about it. So the last half of verse 40, we see she does this. And she went up to him, meaning Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Martha is looking for some help. Likely, the typical scenario would have been that her sister, who is likely younger, living with Martha, uh, would have been the helper in the home when they had guests. And Martha is feeling somewhat betrayed here. And so Martha looks to Jesus for help. Like, Jesus, please tell my sister to help me. In Martha's, or in Martha's eyes, Mary is being lazy, and she's not doing what she ought to be doing. Mary just seemed to be relaxing in the living room with Jesus while Martha did all the work. And Jesus responds to Martha in verse 41 and 42. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Now I want you to notice Jesus' response. There is some sort of tenderness to his reply to Martha. In John chapter 11, we see that Jesus really did love Martha, and so this is a tender response to someone that he loves. We might be tempted to read this answer as an outright stern rebuke, but I don't actually see it that way at all. He's just like, Martha, Martha. And the repeating of her name adds this sense of loving tenderness to what he's about to tell her. Jesus tells Martha that she has been troubled and anxious about many unnecessary things. In other words, she is worried that the roast beef would be just perfect and that the coffee was fresh and that the dishes got cleaned up and that the house was staying clean and on and on and on. These things concerned Martha as she wanted to make sure Jesus and the rest of the guests would have a good experience. But notice how Jesus does not tell her that all those things are bad. In fact, those are all very good things. Maybe at first glance you might have thought that this story is a story of good versus bad. Mary was the good sister because she's listening to Jesus, and Martha's the bad one because she's serving and distracted with many things. But I don't think the problem here is with Martha serving. Imagine the great privilege of serving Jesus in your home. This is actually a great honor to serve Jesus in your home. The problem was not necessarily with her serving, but with the fact that she was anxious and worried about the serving and that she was upset with her sister for sitting at the feet of Jesus and taking in his every word instead of helping her out. And it may have caused Martha's motives for serving to drift from what they should have been. Instead of serving out of joy for the fact that Jesus was in her house, she began serving so that she would not look like a failure. At this moment, she was more in love with the perfect service and with herself than she was with the presence of Jesus. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus being taught and trained, and Martha was serving Jesus. They're both doing very good things. I don't want, want you to think that Jesus is frowning upon serving. He isn't. In fact, if you read Scripture, you're going to find that one of the characteristics of someone who loves Jesus is someone who serves God and serves others. This is actually a very good thing for Jesus' followers to do. So then what is the problem here? The problem is when we forget why we serve. The problem comes when the things we do distract us from Jesus instead of drawing us closer to him. And all the while we think we are earning favor from him. When serving becomes more important than Jesus himself, or when, when it becomes, I guess, in the way, uh, the way in which we think we, we can earn favor with Jesus, then we've missed the point. When we think we're gaining standing with Jesus by our service and we do our good works to bring us glory and accolades, this is actually when our service becomes selfish. Martha had done a good thing. She had invited Jesus and his followers, likely, into her home. She had served them so that they could more fo fully focus on Jesus. In fact, she had served them so well that Mary actually just sat there at the feet of Jesus, listening and, and learning. What Martha was doing here was good for everyone except for Martha. And just like Martha, when we serve, over time, sometimes the excitement of serving starts to wear off. 
And we start to overthink things. And you can imagine that after a while, instead of serving so that others could enjoy Jesus more fully, she starts serving to make sure that her cooking and her meals and her home look perfect in the eyes of Jesus. She longs for his approval and thinks that her good works or her service will reward her with that approval that she so desires. The motives start to drift. She's thinking, I, I need to make sure that I have a fresh pot of coffee. I can't have stale coffee. I can't have bad coffee for my guest, especially this guest. I would never live that down. You know, you kind of get the picture. We all tend to do this. We drift from serving others for their good to serving them so that we look good to them in return for their favor and praise. And then imagine you see your sister just sitting there, all smug, smile on her face, listening to Jesus, not helping out at all, making things much more difficult for you to obtain the favor from Jesus that you really want. And it makes you bitter. If only she would help, then everything would be just perfect. We could get these dishes done, the house would be clean, then maybe I could sit down at Jesus' feet too. I can't be seen sitting down when there's all these things to do. And Martha became more concerned with the tasks than with Jesus. And her focus shifted from serving Jesus and serving her guests out of love to serving for approval and love. Instead of being enamored by Jesus, she was anxious about serving, hoping Jesus would become enamored with her. The truth is Jesus already loved her even before she had done one act of service. Jesus' gentle response to Martha is a reminder to her of the reason that she ought to serve in the first place. She should be serving because she already loves Jesus, or because Jesus already loves her, I should say. Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus, knowing that this was a special time. To have Jesus in your home was an honor and a rare one at that. And she soaked in this opportunity to be with him. She need not seek after his love through serving because Jesus already loved her just the way she was. You see, Jesus was the necessary thing. Jesus was the good thing or the good portion. Martha, instead of serving Jesus because of his love for her, served him in search for approval and love even though she already had it. Her worry over the fact that everything had to be just right was not out of love for Jesus, but out of a selfish desire to appear perfect to Jesus and to her guests. In this instance... Even though Martha was a friend to Jesus and loved Jesus, she allowed herself to subtly slip from a lover of Jesus to a lover of self. How often do we allow ourselves to fall into that same trap that Martha fell into? We do good things, and at first it's because we want to love and serve Jesus with those good things. But we, maybe we get good at it, and we get a pat on the back for what a good job we've done, and then we start to chase the high of a compliment or a good reputation instead of pursuing Jesus. We want to gain the approval of God and that when, when God already has granted us approval based on the perfect service of Jesus Christ. And we're going to get more into that in just a little bit. If, if I'm honest with you, I have to confess that this is me far more often than I would like to admit publicly. It seems that no matter what I do, even if I start off with good intentions, I slip into doing it for my own glory and for my own love of self, and I feel like if I do good, I'm going to be able to gain favor with Jesus. Everything we do ought to be done for God's glory and not our own, but it's so easy to slip into doing things for our own benefit without even, without even realizing it. It's so easy to think our, own, our good works and our service merit us some sort of favor, and we get angry when others don't help us in our efforts to gain that favor. Those of you who know me know that I'm in the construction world, and if, if you really know me, uh, you, you're going to probably know that I'm incredibly particular. Most would say I'm too picky, too fussy, and that would probably be fair to say. When I build things, I want them to be perfect. And uh, I had a crew of men for, for many years, and we built many different buildings, and if the people on my crew didn't do things perfectly, if the concrete forms weren't set up perfectly straight or the wood walls weren't braced exactly perfect or if something didn't work out just right, I would get angry. And I still do sometimes. It's something I work with to this day. But the reason I got angry is because I didn't want to have the customer see that poor workmanship and attach it to my name. I was worried about my name, my reputation, or my glory, you could say. 
I didn't want the customer to think that I was bad at my job. I wanted to have good favor with them when it came time for them to pay the bill. If the customers were to tell someone that, you know, Mark built that building, the first thing that should pop into that person's brain should be that if Mark built it, well, then it's good. What I did mattered to myself, or mattered to me, and I thought I could gain favor from my customers by doing things perfectly, and for the most part, that was my aim. Now, there is nothing wrong with building things right and straight and correctly and good. In fact, that's actually a very good thing, but it all comes down to the why. If I had built things good and right and perfectly because everything I was doing, uh, I was doing it for God himself, then that's great. If I was doing it for my customer, then, then that's good. But I was doing it so that my customer would not think poorly of me. And, so I, and, and also so that I wouldn't have a problem collecting payment later. I did it for selfish reasons. If I was building things perfectly because I wanted my customer to have the best possible product and I wanted to image, for, image forth as best that I could, the perfection of Jesus Christ, my Savior, then, then that would have been great and wonderful. If I held the guys on my crew to a high standard of workmanship because I wanted them to see the picture of the perfect work of Jesus on our behalf, then that would have been great, but, but I didn't. I was more concerned about my name, my reputation, and so I would get upset with my guys, just like Martha was upset with her sister. They were not helping me earn the favor that I so desired. I did the work for me to quash my anxiety, to quash my worry, in some sense, to be my own hero and to be my own savior. And when my guys would screw up, I would get angry because it reflected badly on me and I couldn't have something reflecting badly on me. And that's how I see Martha here. Her thoughts have gone from serving Jesus and others to actually serving herself through her service to others. What she's really saying is this, Jesus, tell my sister to help out so that everything's going to be perfect. I don't, I don't want to have to be anxious or worried about what my hosting skills will look like to you and others, so I need my sister to help out. And I think we all get caught up just like Martha does at times. I can even think back to when we planted Grace Warman, and I think as, as best that we could have, we did it out of a love for Jesus and a love for people, and out of a, a, this real desire for others in this community to know who Jesus is. But there are times when in my mind I start to slip and I drift. I'm more concerned about what my sermon will sound like to others, or if there will be lots of people on a Sunday, or if the Sunday morning service will go off without a hitch because I don't want my own reputation with Jesus and with others to take a hit. And sometimes I slip into that mindset where I serve others for the purpose of my own good and try to gain favor with God. And I might get upset at myself because I bombed a sermon or get upset with someone else because something happened that caused something to go wrong. At the person doing the slides because they forgot to change them and they fell asleep at the table. Or who knows what. It could be any insignificant thing. And I feel Because I feel like if, if things go badly, it reflects badly on me in front of Jesus. And I need to repent of that. Sometimes I'm more concerned with everything being perfect for my own glory than I am concerned about them being perfect to image forth the perfection of Jesus. Sometimes I'm more concerned about what Jesus thinks of my good works than I'm concerned about just soaking him in and being filled with him and thinking that it would my service will somehow grant me some extra favor and more love if I serve him better somehow. The reality is, though, that Jesus came to serve me and he gave me all of him. And now I ought to serve him out of a fullness of him as a picture to the world around me of what he's done for me. He must first fill me up with him before I can worship him through service. And so what do we do if this is us, if we try to earn favor by our service? What if we do if we serve for the sake of self instead of for the sake of Jesus? Well, then we put down our serving for a while, and we do like Mary, and we sit at the feet of Jesus. We remind ourselves of who Jesus is. We get filled up and reminded of his ultimate service to us. We take in the good portion. 
before we can serve any of that good portion to others. We must be full of Jesus before we can image forth Jesus properly to others through our service. We remind ourselves that Jesus, he is God become flesh. He is the perfect man. He came to this world. He lived the perfect life. He was unjustly accused and judged guilty of crimes he didn't commit. And he took the punishment of of our crimes, our sins. And he took that upon his shoulders. And he died on the cross to pay for our guilt, to pay for our sin. And then he miraculously, he he defeats death and he rises to life and he he sits at the right hand of God the Father himself. And he did all of this so that you and I could be declared pure and right so that we could be brought into his kingdom. This is the ultimate service that Jesus has provided for us. He has already loved us enough to do this for us all before we have done anything good, before we have performed any acts of service. By coming to this world, Jesus performed the ultimate act of loving service so that we would not have to. So that all the acts of service that we do now, they don't define us. We should, we should, however, serve in such a way that we image forth Jesus. If we are filled with the good portion, if we are filled with God himself, the Holy Spirit, if we are filled with love, worship, and admiration of who Jesus is and what he's done for us, then we can serve out of a heart of fullness, not out of a heart of anxiety and worry about what our service looks like to others. When we sit at the feet of Jesus and through his scripture learn about who he is and what he's done for us, then when we talk to him through prayer and we make our requests known to him and we seek after him, when we gather with the church and receive his grace through the people of the church and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to be drawn in to acts of service to imitate and image forth the ultimate act of service that Jesus has done for us. So, if you know who Jesus is and you are continually being filled with the knowledge of who he is and what he's done for us, if you are continually being filled with the good portion, Jesus himself, your love for him will grow and out of that love, your life will change. At work, it means you'll be doing your job in the best way that you can as an act of service to both your boss and your co-workers to show how Jesus did his ultimate act of service for you. He paid your debt, he brought, he, and he brought you, an undeserving, morally and spiritually bankrupt person, into his kingdom. And this attitude of service will flow through you, not just to your co-workers or employees or employers, but to your neighbors and your fellow students and your family and friends. And you can be a picture of Jesus through your acts of service. But if you're missing Jesus, if you're missing the good portion that Jesus mentions to Martha, that Mary is getting, if service gets in the way of you knowing Jesus and knowing the good portion, you can easily slip into Martha's mistake. We have to remember that we cannot serve out of our own strength because we're just going to crumble. And we're going to get upset when things don't go our way. And if this happens, you need to slow down. Once again, sit at the feet of Jesus. Take him in, reminding yourself that your service does not gain you favor. It does not define you. But rather, it is a privilege to serve out of the knowledge of Jesus, of who he is, what he's done. And out of the fullness of the knowledge of him, you can then go forth and serve others. You can only do this if you are full of who Jesus is. If you miss the real good portion. If you miss Jesus, then your service is going to be meaningless and it will crush you when it doesn't go well. If you understand who Jesus is, then you will not be crushed by the weight of perfect service, but you will serve to the best of your ability knowing that Jesus offers grace for the times when things go poorly. He has already given us the perfect act of service by bringing us into his family. And if we repent of our wrongdoing, and if we believe in him, we can now serve him out of joy for what he has already done for us, not with anxiousness and worry for what we must do, because Jesus has done the ultimate act of service for us. Let's pray. Father, we just want to say thank you once again for sending your son to offer us what we did not deserve, that he came to be a servant to to us and for our benefit. 
And now we can be filled with joy because of this amazing inheritance that is now ours because of what Jesus has done for us. I just pray that this knowledge of Jesus and this understanding of the good news of who he is and what he's done, this understanding of the gospel would just turn us into loving servants so that the world can see the clearest possible picture of who you are through your church, through your people. I pray that we'd never serve out of our own ambition for favor and love from others and from you, but rather that we would serve out of the fullness of your love for us. I pray this in your name. Amen.